There's a good market for sports pictures. Guess I'm lucky, replied Aaron Rubino, San Mateo, California, junior college frosh when asked how he had succeeded so well with the sideline to his pre-medical course. A smiling, black-haired giant of 19, Rube, as he is known, takes pictures with a Graflex plate camera pictures that sell. Photography always interested him but it became his hobby in 1935 when he was given a photo finishing outfit. He went to football games and snapped highlight plays. One Saturday on the field he asked a photographer for help in getting a picture. The man was a star cameraman for the San Francisco Chronicle. He not only gave the advice but told Rube to come to the office anytime he needed information. Rube did. A friendship developed, and today that newspaper man is a friend of the Rubino family. The boy spent every spare moment taking and developing pictures. He was getting orders. He specialized in athletic subjects because he was so keen about sports. One day he showed some pictures to the sports editor of the Chronicle who accepted them and offered to buy others as good. Rube submitted them by the dozen gaining the liking of the editorial staff by his perseverance and enthusiasm. He was given the use of the darkroom and the benefit of expert advice. At first, he supplied his own films and paid his way to photographed events many times wasted effort when his photos didn't sell. But today he rarely has a failure and the newspaper gives him assignments and pays for films in addition to pictures used. He has a press batch gets free passes to all athletic events, and knows practically every newspaper man in town. Being with the staff but not of it is an advantage, he points out. The freelance can sell prints and retain his negative, something a staff photographer cannot do. Rube sells to the United Press, Associated Press, Wide World, and other good markets. Here are his suggestions to prospective freelance cameramen. Always be on time. He learned this when, after watching a school fire from 12 until 3 in the morning. He rushed home to develop his pictures and got them to the Chronicle by 4 o'clock only to be told too late, we've gone to press. Don't be afraid to talk to people. He often hitchhikes the 19 miles home from college because he likes to contact people and has had lifts in everything from a Ford to a Packard. It's a swell way to learn human nature, he declares. Be resourceful. Resourcefulness brought him his biggest thrill and a scoop. At college one morning he heard that a red demonstration was to be staged on the campus at high noon. What a chance for her pictures. But, alas, his camera was at home. Attending morning classes he wrestled with the problem of getting those pictures and when the demonstration came off there was Rube in the thick of it clicking away. He had borrowed the school camera. He recorded the wild scene with eggs and tomatoes by the bushel flying through the air hitting policemen and college dignitaries who were trying to quell the disorder. Rube was the only photographer present and the rioters tried to smash him and his camera but he got away and rushed down to the Chronicle office. Other newspapers tried to buy his pictures but he wouldn't sell and the Chronicle was the only paper carrying photographs to accompany the big headline story. Said Rube, I just fought my way through the mob. Guess it was luck. Luck? Sounds more like pluck. Five dollars a day stenciling house. Numbers and curbstones. Back in 1937, it looked as if two students, Ralph and George, at Northwestern University, Evanston, Illinois, would be unable to return for their fourth year unless some unknown source of revenue could be tapped and, as they agreed, the sooner the better. It was Ralph who got the bright idea for making money one evening when calling on his latest big moment. Two people in a car stopped in front of the house where he was, calling and inquired whether it was such and such a number. After he had directed them, he realized that you simply could not see the house number from the curb. That 
That night when he got back to the room he shared with George. They put their heads together and after some plain and fancy figuring found they could make a tidy sum of money by painting house numbers on the curbstones in front of the houses of Evanston Ians. With a set of marking stencils. Each boy took one side of the street. In front of a house. One of the boys would brush a square of white paint on the curb and then ring the doorbell. When the householder appeared the white space was pointed out, and he was asked if he wouldn't like to see his house number painted in black on the white space. It is surprising how many were actually eager to have the job done. In fact, about three quarters of the householders of Evanston had house numbers painted on their curbstones before the boys had finished. The white spaces were painted first along the street and then the boys came back and stenciled the black numbers thus allowing time for the white paint to dry. A charge of 25 cents was made for any combination of numbers and the first morning in four hours they completed 22 orders each making a total of $5.50 for the morning's work apiece. Every Saturday and as many hours before and after classes as they could manage these two enterprising businessmen worked at their jobs. Before long they found that they had about exhausted the market in Evanston. They then moved on to the section just south of Evanston which is Chicago proper and worked that territory. When that was worked out they moved on to other suburbs north and numbered the residents as Ralph termed it. During the spring vacation, they finished the sections north and west of Evanston and when the summer vacation came around they decided to take their paint and brushes and number the natives along the route to Ralph's home, where George was spending the summer. In the farm sections along the way, they painted rural mailboxes with aluminum paint and stenciled the name, post office, RFD route, and box number. For this work, a charge of 50 cents was made. During the summer they worked the territory, in and around Ralph's hometown of 150,000 people and the fall term saw them with more than enough money to finish their fourth year's tuition. Students earn money as proxy parents. About two years ago, Miss G. Allison Raymond, a graduate of Bryn Mawr, found it impossible to locate anything other than a temporary job. After weeks of unsuccessful scouting, she realized that she would have to make her own job. Making a job is, of course, much more difficult than finding one. However, Miss Raymond's special aptitude for organization has enabled her to make an unusual success in an out-of-the-ordinary enterprise she calls Proxy Parents. Proxy Parents provides employment for young students who find it necessary to make money during odd hours. These Proxy Parents are on call anytime during the day and evening. For instance, if Mrs. Jones' little daughter is coming home from school or camp and the mother cannot meet the train, she calls proxy parents and a student is called to take over the job of seeing that Priscilla reaches home safely. Or, if a mother has a convalescent child and wants someone to amuse him, read to him or play games with him, she calls proxy parents. Besides meeting trains, amusing convalescent children in their homes or in hospitals, proxy parents will take charge of play hours during rainy days, take children singly or in groups to museums. The moving pictures, beaches, playgrounds, parks, or other specified places. Students are also on call for an hour or two to stay with a child while the mother shops or they will take charge of a child during the evenings when the parents are away. A clever girl whose course of study is not too heavy could develop such an enterprise during her third and fourth college years with the idea of continuing it after graduation. A card file of students' names, free hours, and special abilities, and a list of families in town having children, form the basis for a proxy parent business.